Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus opens our meditation for today by telling his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You are about to learn something profound from Jesus today, something that not even the prophets and the kings of old were fully able to hear and to see. And Jesus says that what he is going to tell you will make you blessed. And to be blessed by God is no small matter at all, because it means you are going to find yourself inside of his grace and his mercy. And so it is that the gospel lesson continues with an account about a lawyer who questioned Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's an honest question, one of great importance. And you are blessed to hear it. Because it's not the kind of question that gets asked very often anymore. You are surrounded by a worldly people who are concerned only for the day. They give endless thought to all sorts of mammon, how they will get it, how they will keep it. It comes to define their lives. No doubt, by virtue of the fact that you live in such a time, you too will be tempted be concerned more with the things of the world than the things of God. It's why this question today is so important, because it gives you a chance to meditate on what really matters. Not only is this question important, but so also is the one who is going to give the answer. The lawyer was right to ask this question of Jesus, because he is the teacher of eternal life. You wouldn't normally go to a Latin teacher and ask him a math question. You wouldn't go to a science teacher and ask him a question about literature. They may know something of those subjects, and I would certainly hope that they do. But when you want to learn something, you usually go to the authority. When it comes to eternal life, this lawyer goes to the right authority. He goes to the only teacher who actually knows what is eternal life. In response to the lawyer's question, the greatest teacher answers, What is written in the law? How do you read it? One might expect Jesus to kind of just speak on his own. He certainly has the authority to do it. But on this occasion, he doesn't do that. Instead, he appeals to something he considers authoritative on the subject. He appeals to the word of God. He who knows both eternity and life tells you that if you want to know something about eternal life, you will find the truth about it in the word of God. And the lawyer, he seems to know something about this word. For he replies to Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer speaks quite well from the word of God. If you're going to do something to inherit eternal life, well, then that's what you have to do. And so Jesus, he looks at him and he says, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But knowing what must be done in order to inherit eternal life and being able to do that very thing, well, those are not quite the same. So the lawyer, standing there, then looks at Jesus and he follows up with another question, asking him, who is my name? If he is to inherit eternal life by the keeping of the law, he must ascertain what it means to be a neighbor. And then this is where the parable that we know so well of the Good Samaritan comes in. Jesus describes a man on a journey heading down from Jerusalem. He's attacked by robbers, beaten and stripped of his clothing. 
It's a really terrible circumstance if you think about it. I mean, just try and put yourself in the place of this person actually being beaten and having your clothes even taken from you. Kind of the only thing that's left in that sort of situation is probably a lot of tears and a sense of hopelessness. And in the midst of this, well, there comes a priest. But he chooses not to get too close to the man who's been injured. So he passes by on the other side. Eventually, a Levite comes along as well, and he chooses to do the same thing as the priest. Finally, a Samaritan travels along this same road, and he reaches the injured man. He looks upon him, and he has compassion, binding up his wounds, taking him to a safe place at his own expense where the man can be made well. It's not very hard to determine among these three who actually is the neighbor to the beaten man. I mean, that's why the lawyer says, it's the one who showed mercy. Jesus responds one more time. He says, you go and do likewise. If you want to keep the law to inherit eternal life, this and all things like it is what you actually have to do. Now, I find it kind of interesting. The text never states what the lawyer's response was to Jesus' concluding words. But it may be fair to assume, like most of those who question Jesus, there might have been a long period of silence that followed. For who can actually do what Jesus demands? And this is where the parable of the Good Samaritan is so often misunderstood. Typically, interpreters race to use it as an exhortation to love and serve the neighbor. Because Jesus does want all of his people to love and serve the neighbor. And that's, that's the meaning of the law today in the text. But Jesus says what he does to speak to the lawyer's question about what he has to do to inherit eternal life. He must love everyone with compassion and mercy, giving up his own time, his own money, even for others he doesn't know. Nor must he only do that once or twice in his life, but always over the whole course of his life. No one can do what Jesus asks. No one can love the neighbor in such ways, let alone love God with that kind of love. And you see, this brings us back to Jesus' initial words for today when he says that you are blessed to hear what Jesus is saying. Because not even the prophets or the kings have heard such a teaching of God so clearly. If you want to save yourself, you know what you need to do. You need to give up your love of worldly things. You must love all of your neighbors by being a true neighbor to them, seeking only their good, laying aside your own wants and desires so that all their needs of both body and soul may be met. Do that, and you will live. Do it not, and you will deserve to lose eternal life. I doubt there is anyone here today in that moment of honesty who's actually going to believe that they have done all these things. You and I deserve to lose eternal life if we want to be saved by the law. This is what the greatest teacher of eternal life has to say on the matter to the lawyer and to us. Now, it may not seem like a great blessing to hear that kind of teaching, because it makes guilty of all sinners when they hear this word. The world doesn't like to feel its guilt knowing that it can't do what God demands. That's why the world, it, it kind of just wants to live for today. Live for all the desires of the flesh. Don't be concerned with eternal life. That's what it's going to tell you. Because eternal life either doesn't exist or because of your goodness, you will have earned it. The thing is, eternal life does exist. But you and I and everyone else over this whole earth will never earn it. What the prophets and the kings longed to hear was the answer to this very problem of how sinners are supposed to inherit eternal life when they do not serve God or their neighbor 
in such a way that they can actually merit it. In the days of old, they longed to have the fullness of this answer proclaimed to them. For they had it only in a form yet veiled. They knew God would triumph over sin and the death that resulted from it. They had the promise that a child of Eve would one day conquer the devil. They had the promise that was given to Abraham that his seed would be a blessing to all nations. They were told that the, <clears throat> that the virgin would conceive and the child would be God with them. But it was not until the fullness of time that the child of Eve, the seed of Abraham, and the baby of the virgin would come to redeem mankind from the sin that has enslaved the whole world. Under the law of God, there would be no hope for fallen mankind whatsoever because it is impossible for the sinful to love God and the neighbor with one's whole being. But what is impossible for you and I is not impossible for God. You are blessed today because this truth is made known to you. A truth that says you can't save yourself by loving God and the neighbor. Instead, you must come to inherit eternal life by the promised Savior. Jesus is the teacher of eternal life, but he does not merely teach as one who knows abstractly. He teaches as one who has done what he says and who has fulfilled the very things of which the word of God has spoken. Jesus alone has kept the law of the Lord. He has loved the neighbor absolutely. His words to all the people that he met were always words of truth. He did not lie or deceive. He spoke of the things of God and the things of men as they actually are. He had compassion, loving the widow, caring for the sick, never turning away those who were brought to him, not even the lowliest child. And in the end, he loved God with his whole being. For he submitted to the will of the Lord for him, even when that meant being hated by those to whom he was sent. So great was Jesus' faithfulness that he even willingly followed God's desire to see him die a most shameful death, because death was the only just punishment for sin. Jesus teaches of what he knows. He is from eternity, and he is the author of life. And he has entered our time that he might be seen in the flesh and heard in the word, so that through his faithfulness to God and his church, you might receive the gift of eternal life. That's come to you by faith in him, not through anything that you have done, but simply as a gift of God's grace and his mercy. Christ has allowed his righteous life and service to God and the neighbor to pass to you who simply trust in him. And in its place, he has taken away all of your sins and he has claimed them as his own. And the result of this is that you now appear in Christ as one who has never sinned in the whole course of your life. I mean, just imagine that. Appearing with not one single sin in the whole realm of your being. It now looks as though to God that you have loved your neighbor at all times and in all places and in every manner possible. And not only that, in Christ, it looks like you have always loved God. And now because you appear righteous in the eyes of our Heavenly Father, you will be saved from the eternal death which you deserve. Is it really any wonder then why Jesus says that the prophets and the kings long to hear and to see what you hear and see this day? For in Christ, you and all God's people have received what the saints of old long to know in fullness. You have received eternal life in the righteousness of the Son of God. And there is no more greater or more precious gift you will ever receive, which is exactly why Jesus said, you are blessed. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.